The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume One, The Mystery of Marie Roget, Part Two. It was soon after dark upon this same evening that Madame de Luc, as well as her eldest son, heard the screams of a female in the vicinity of the inn. The screams were violent but brief. Madame D. recognized not only the scarf which was found in the thicket, but the dress which was discovered upon the corpse. An omnibus driver, Valence, now also testified that he saw Marie Roget cross a ferry on the Seine on the Sunday in question, in company with a young man of dark complexion. He, Valence, knew Marie, and could not be mistaken in her identity. The articles found in the thicket were fully identified by the relatives of Marie. The items of evidence and information thus collected by myself, from the newspapers, at the suggestion of Dupin, embraced only one more point, but this was a point of seemingly vast consequence. It appears that, immediately after the discovery of the clothes as above described, the lifeless, or nearly lifeless, body of saint Eustache, Marie's betrothed, was found in the vicinity of what all now supposed the scene of the outrage. A file, labelled laudanum, and emptied, was found near him. His breath gave evidence of the poison. He died without speaking. Upon his person was found a letter, briefly stating his love for Marie, with his design for self-destruction. "'I need scarcely tell you,' said Dupin, as he finished the perusal of my notes, that this is a far more intricate case than that of the Rue Morgue, from which it differs in one important respect. This is an ordinary, although an atrocious, instance of crime. There is nothing peculiarly outré about it. You will observe that, for this reason, the mystery has been considered easy, when for this reason it should have been considered difficult of solution. Thus, at first, it was thought unnecessary to offer a reward. The myrmidons of G were able at once to comprehend how and why such an atrocity might have been committed. They could picture to their imaginations a mode, many modes, and a motive, many motives. And because it was not impossible that either of these numerous modes and motives could have been the actual one, they have taken it for granted that one of them must. But the case with which these valuable fancies were entertained, and the very plausibility which each assumed, should have been understood as indicative rather of the difficulties than of the facilities which must attend elucidation. I have before observed that it is by prominences above the plane of the ordinary that reason feels her way, if at all, in her search for the true, and that the proper question, in cases such as this, is not so much what has occurred, as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In the investigations at the house of Madame L'Espanay, the agents of G were discouraged and confounded by that very unusualness which, to a proper regulated intellect, would have afforded the surest omen of success, while this same intellect might have been plunged in despair at the ordinary character of all that met the eye in the case of the perfumery girl, and yet told of nothing but easy triumph to the functionaries of the prefecture. In the case of Madame L'Espanay and her daughter, there was, even at the beginning of our investigation, no doubt that murder had been committed. The idea of suicide was excluded at once. Here, too, we are freed, at the commencement, from all supposition of self-murder. The body found at the barrière du Roule was found under such circumstances as to leave us no room for embarrassment upon this important point. But it has been suggested that the corpse discovered is not that of the Marie Roger for the conviction of whose assassin or assassins the reward is offered, and respecting whom, solely, our agreement has been arranged with the prefect. We both know this gentleman well. It will not do to trust him too far. 
if dating our inquiries from the body found and thence tracing a murderer we yet discover this body to be that of some other individual than marie or if starting from the living marie we find her yet find her unassassinated in either case we lose our labour since it is m g with whom we have to deal for our own purpose therefore if not for the purpose of justice it is indispensable that our first step should be the determination of the identity of the corpse with the marie Roger who is missing with the public the arguments of l'etoile have had weight and that the journal itself is convinced of their importance would appear from the manner in which it commences one of its essays upon the subject several of the morning papers of the day it says speak of the conclusive article in monday's l'etoile to me this article appears conclusive of little beyond the zeal of its inditer we should bear in mind that in general it is the object of our newspapers rather to create a sensation to make a point than to further the cause of truth the latter end is only pursued when it seems coincident with the former it's a print which merely falls in with ordinary opinion however well founded this opinion may be earns for itself no credit with the mob the mass of the people regard as profound only him who suggests pungent contradictions of the general idea in ratiocination not less than in literature it is the epigram which is the most immediately and most universally appreciated in both it is of the lowest order of merit what i mean to say is that it is the mingled epigram and melodrama of the idea that marie roger still lives rather than any true plausibility in this idea which have suggested it to l'etoile and secured it a favourable reception with the public let us examine the heads of this journal's argument endeavouring to avoid the incoherence with which it is originally set forth the first aim of the writer is to show from the brevity of the interval between marie's disappearance and the finding of the floating corpse that this corpse cannot be that of marie the reduction of this interval to its smallest possible dimension becomes thus at once an object with the reasoner in the rash pursuit of this object he rushes into mere assumption at the outset it is folly to suppose he says that the murder if murder was committed on her body could have been consummated soon enough to have enabled the her murderers to throw the body into the river before midnight we demand at once and very naturally why why is it folly to suppose that the murder was committed within five minutes after the girl's quitting her mother's house why is it folly to suppose that the murder was committed at any given period of the day there have been assassinations at all hours but had the murder taken place at any moment between nine o'clock in the morning of sunday and a quarter before midnight there would still have been time enough to throw the body into the river before midnight this assumption then amounts precisely to this that the murder was not committed on sunday at all and if we allow l'etoile to assume this we may permit it any liberties whatever the paragraph beginning it is folly to suppose that the murder etc however it appears as printed in l'etoile may be imagined to have existed actually thus in the brain of its inditer it is folly to suppose that the murder if murder was committed on the body could have been committed soon enough to have enabled her murderers to throw the body into the river before midnight it is folly we say to suppose all this and to suppose at the same time as we are resolved to suppose that the body was not thrown in until after midnight a sentence sufficiently inconsequential in itself but not so utterly preposterous as the one printed were it my purpose continued dupin merely to make out a case against this passage of l'etoile's argument i might safely leave it where it is it is not however with l'etoile that we have to do but with the truth the sentence in question has but one meaning as it stands 
and this meaning I have fairly stated. But it is material that we go behind the mere words for an idea which these words have obviously intended and failed to convey. It was the design of the journalist to say that, in whatever period of the day or night of Sunday this murder was committed, it was improbable that the assassins would have ventured to bear the corpse to the river before midnight. And herein lies, really, the assumption of which I complain. It is assumed that the murder was committed at such a position, and under such circumstances, that the bearing it to the river became necessary. Now, the assassination might have taken place on the river's brink, or on the river itself, and thus the throwing the corpse into the water might have been resorted to, at any period of the day or night, as the most obvious and most immediate mode of disposal. You will understand that I suggest nothing here as probable, or as coincident with my own opinion. My design, so far, has no reference to the facts of the case. I wish merely to caution you against the whole tone of L'Etoile's suggestion, by calling your attention to its ex parte character at the outset. Having prescribed thus a limit to suit his own preconceived notions, having assumed that, if this were the body of Marie, it could have been in the water but a very brief time, the journal goes on to say, all experience has shown that drowned bodies, or bodies thrown into the water immediately after death by violence, require from six to ten days for sufficient decomposition to take place to bring them to the top of the water. Even when a cannon is fired over a corpse, and it rises before at least five or six days' immersion, it sinks again if let alone. These assertions have been tacitly received by every paper in Paris with the exception of Le Moniteur. This latter print endeavours to combat that portion of the paragraph, which has reference to drowned bodies only, by citing some five or six instances in which the bodies of individuals known to be drowned were found floating after the lapse of less time than is insisted upon by L'Etoile. But there is something excessively unphilosophical in the attempt on the part of Le Moniteur to rebut the general assertion of L'Etoile by a citation of particular instances militating against that assertion. Had it been possible to adduce fifty, instead of five, examples of bodies found floating at the end of two or three days, these fifty examples could still have been properly regarded only as exceptions to L'Etoile's rule, until such time as the rule itself should be confuted. Admitting the rule, and this Le Moniteur does not deny, insisting merely upon its exceptions, the argument of L'Etoile is suffered to remain in full force, for this argument does not pretend to involve more than a question of the probability of the body having risen to the surface in less than three days, and this probability will be in favour of L'Etoile's position, until the instances so childishly adduced shall be sufficient in number to establish an antagonistical rule. You will see at once that all argument upon this head should be urged, if at all, against the rule itself. And for this end we must examine the rationale of the rule. Now, the human body, in general, is neither much lighter nor much heavier than the water of the Seine. That is, that is to say, the specific gravity of a human body, in its natural condition, is about equal to the bulk of the fresh water which it displaces. The bodies of fat and fleshy persons, with small bones, and of women generally, are lighter than those of the lean and large-boned, and of men, and the specific gravity of the water of a river is somewhat influenced by the presence of the tide from the sea. But, leaving this tide out of the question, it may be said that very few human bodies will sink at all, even in fresh water, of their own accord. Almost any one, falling into a river, will be enabled to float, if he suffer the specific gravity of the water fairly to be adduced in comparison with his own, that is to say, if he suffer his whole person to be immersed, with as little exception as possible. The proper position for one who cannot swim is the upright position of a walker on land, 
with the head thrown fully back and immersed, the mouth and nostrils alone remaining above the surface. Thus circumstanced, we shall find that we float without difficulty and without exertion. It is evident, however, that the gravities of the body and of the bulk of water displaced are very nicely balanced, and that a trifle will cause either to preponderate. An arm, for instance, uplifted from the water, and thus deprived of its support, is an additional weight sufficient to immerse the whole head, while the accidental aid of the smallest piece of timber will enable us to elevate the head so as to look about. Now, in the struggles of one unused to swimming, the arms are invariably thrown upwards, while an attempt is made to keep the head in its usual perpendicular position. The result is the immersion of the mouth and nostrils, and the inception, during efforts to breathe while beneath the surface, of water into the lungs. Much is also received into the stomach, and the whole body becomes heavier by the difference between the weight of the air original distending these cavities and that of the fluid which now fills them. This difference is sufficient to cause the body to sink as a general rule but is insufficient in the cases of individuals with small bones and an abnormal quantity of flaccid or fatty matter. Such individuals float even after drowning. The corpse, being supposed at the bottom of the river, will there remain until by some means its specific gravity again becomes less than that of the bulk of water which it displaces. This effect is brought about by decomposition, or otherwise. The result of decomposition is the generation of gas, distending the cellular tissues and all the cavities, and giving the puffed appearance which is so horrible. When this distension has so far progressed that the bulk of the corpse is material increased without a corresponding increase of mass or weight, its specific gravity becomes less than that of the water displaced, and it forthwith makes its appearance at the surface. But decomposition is modified by innumerable circumstances, is hastened or retarded by innumerable agencies, for example, by the heat or cold of the season, by the mineral impregnation or purity of the water, by its depth of shallowness, by its currency or stagnation, by the temperament of the body, by its infection or freedom from disease before death. Thus it is evident that we can assign no period, with anything like accuracy, at which the corpse shall rise through decomposition. Under certain conditions this result would be brought about within an hour. Under others it might not take place at all. There are chemical infusions by which the animal frame can be preserved forever from corruption. The bichloride of mercury is one. But apart from decomposition, there may be, and very usually is, a generation of gas within the stomach from the acetous fermentation of vegetable matter, or within other cavities from other causes, sufficient to induce a distension which will bring the body to the surface. The effect produced by the firing of a cannon is that of a simple vibration. This may either loosen the corpse from the soft mud or ooze in which it is embedded, thus permitting it to rise when other agencies have already prepared it for so doing, or it may overcome the tenacity of some putrescent portions of the cellular tissue, allowing the cavities to distend under the influence of the gas. Having thus before us the whole philosophy of this subject, we can easily test it by the assertions of L'Etoile. All experience shows, says this paper, that drowned bodies, or bodies thrown into the water immediately after death by violence, require from six to ten days for sufficient decomposition to take place to bring them to the top of the water. Even when a cannon is fired over a corpse, and it rises before at least five or six days' immersion, it sinks again if left alone. The whole of this paragraph must now appear a tissue of inconsequence and incoherence. All experience does not show that drowned bodies require from six to ten days for sufficient decomposition to take place to bring them to the surface. Both science and experience show that the period of their rising is, and necessarily must be, indeterminate. 
If, moreover, a body has arisen to the surface through firing of cannon, it will not sink again if let alone, until decomposition has so far progressed as to permit the escape of the generated gas. But I wish to call your attention to the distinction which is made between drowned bodies and bodies thrown into the water immediately after death by violence. Although the writer admits the distinction, he yet includes them all in the same category. I have shown how it is that the body of a drowning man becomes specifically heavier than its bulk of water, and that he would not sink at all except for the struggles by which he elevates his arms above the surface, and his gasps for breath while beneath the surface, gasps which supply by water the place of the original air in the lungs. But these struggles and these gasps would not occur in the body thrown into the water immediately after death by violence. Thus, in the latter instance, the body, as a general rule, would not sink at all, a fact of which L'Etoile is evidently ignorant. When decomposition had proceeded to a very great extent, when the flesh had in a great measure left the bones, then, indeed, but not till then, should we lose sight of the corpse. And now, what are we to make of the argument that the body found could not be that of Marie Roger, because, three days only having elapsed, this body was found floating? If drowned, being a woman, she might never have sunk, or, having sunk, might have reappeared in twenty-four hours or less. But no one supposes her to have been drowned, and dying before being thrown into the river, she might have been found floating at any period afterwards, whatever. But, says L'Etoile, if the body had been kept in its mangled state on shore until Tuesday night, some trace would be found on shore of the murderers. Here it is at first difficult to perceive the intention of the reasoner. He means to anticipate what he imagines would be an objection to his theory, that is, as the body was kept on shore two days, suffering rapid decomposition, more rapid than if immersed in water. He supposes that, had this been the case, it might have appeared at the surface on the Wednesday, and thinks that only under such circumstances it could have so appeared. He is accordingly in haste to show that it was not kept on shore, for, if so, some trace would be found on shore of the murderers. I presume you smile at the sequitur. You cannot be made to see how the mere duration of the corpse on the shore could operate to multiply traces of the assassins. Nor can I. And furthermore it is exceedingly improbable, continues our journal, that any villains who had committed such a murder as is here supposed would have thrown the body in without weight to sink it, when such a precaution could have been so easily taken. Observe here the laughable confusion of thought. No one, not even L'Etoile, disputes the murder committed on the body found. The marks of violence are too obvious. It is our reasoner's object merely to show that this body is not Marie's. He wishes to prove that Marie is not assassinated, not that the corpse was not. Yet his observation proves only the latter point. Here is a corpse without weight attached. Murderers, casting it in, would not have failed to attach a weight. Therefore it was not thrown in by murderers. This is all which is proved, if anything is. The question of identity is not even approached. And L'Etoile has been at great pains merely to gainsay now what it has admitted only a moment before. We are perfectly convinced, it says, that the body found was that of a murdered female. Nor is this the sole instance, even in this division of his subject, where our reasoner unwittingly reasons against himself. His evident object, I have already said, is to reduce, as much as possible, the interval between Marie's disappearance and the finding of the corpse. Yet we find him urging the point that no person saw the girl from the moment of her leaving her mother's house. We have no evidence, he says that Marie Roger was in the land of the living after nine o'clock on Sunday, June the twenty-second. As his argument is obviously an ex parte one, he should, at least, have left this matter out of sight. For had any one been known to see Marie, say on Monday or on Tuesday, the interval in question would have been much reduced, and by his own ratiocination 
the probability much diminished of the corpse being that of the grease hat. It is, nevertheless, amusing to observe that L'Etoile insists upon its point in the full belief of its furthering its general argument. Reperuse now that portion of this argument which has reference to the identification of the corpse de Beauvais. In regard to the hair upon the arm, L'Etoile has been obviously disingenuous. M. Beauvais, not being an idiot, could have never urged, in the identification of the corpse, simply hair upon its arm. No arm is without hair. The generality of the expression of L'Etoile is a mere perversion of the witness's phraseology. He must have spoken of some peculiarity in this hair. It must have been a peculiarity of color, of quantity, of length, or of situation. Her foot, says the journal, was small. So are thousands of feet. Her garter is no proof whatever, nor is her shoe, for shoes and garters are sold in package. The same may be said of the flowers in her hat. One thing upon which M. Beauvais strongly insists is that the clasp on the garter found had been set back to take it in. This amounts to nothing, for most women find it proper to take a pair of garters home and fit them to the size of the limbs they are to encircle, rather than to try them in the store where they purchase. Here it is difficult to suppose the reasoner in earnest. Had M. Beauvais, in his search for the body of Marie, discovered a corpse corresponding in general size and appearance to the missing girl, he would have been warranted, without reference to the question of abilimont at all, in forming an opinion that his search had been successful. If, in addition to the point of general size and contour, he had found upon the arm a peculiar hairy appearance, which he had observed upon the living Marie, his opinion might have been justly strengthened, and the increase of positiveness might well have been in the ratio of the peculiarity or unusualness of the hairy mark. If, the feet of Marie being small, those of the corpse were also small, the increase of the probability that the body was that of Marie would not be an increase in the ratio merely arithmetical, but in one highly geometrical or accumulative. And to all this, shoes such as she had been known to wear upon the day of her disappearance, and although these shoes may be sold in packages, you so far augment the probability as to verge upon the certain. What, of itself, would be no evidence of identity, becomes through its corroborative position proof most sure. Give us, then, flowers in the hat corresponding to those worn by the missing girl, and we seek for nothing farther. If only one flower, we seek for nothing farther. What then if two or three, or more? Each successive one is multiple evidence, proof not added to proof but multiplied by hundreds or thousands. Let us now discover, upon the deceased, garters such as the living used, and it is almost folly to proceed. But these garters are found to be tightened by the setting back of a clasp, in just such a manner as her own had been tightened by Marie, shortly previous to her leaving home. It is now madness or hypocrisy to doubt. What L'Etoile says in respect to this abbreviation of the garters being an usual occurrence shows nothing beyond its own pertinacity in error. The elastic nature of the clasp garter is self-demonstration of the unusualness of the abbreviation. What is made to adjust itself must of necessity require foreign adjustments, but rarely. It must have been by an accident, in its strictest sense, that these garters of Marie needed the tightening described. They alone would have amply established her identity, but it is not that the corpse was found to have the garters of the missing girl, or found to have her shoes, or her bonnet, or the flowers of her bonnet, or her feet, or a peculiar mark upon the arm, or her general size and appearance. It is that the corpse had each, and all collectively, could it be proved that the editor of L'Etoile really entertained a doubt, under the circumstances, there would be no need, in his case, of a commission de lunatico inquirendo. He has thought it sagacious to echo the small talk of the lawyers, who for the most part content themselves with echoing the rectangular precepts of the court. I would here observe that very much of what is rejected as evidence by a court is the best evidence to the intellect. 
For the court, guiding itself by the general principles of evidence, the recognized and booked principles, is averse from swerving at particular instances, and this steadfast adherence to principle, with rigorous disregard of the conflicting exception, is a sure mode of attaining the maximum of attainable truth in any long sequence of time. The practice in mass is therefore philosophical, but it is not the less certain that it engenders vast individual error. In respect to the insinuations levelled at Beauvais, you will be willing to dismiss them in a breath. You have already fathomed the true character of this good gentleman. He is a busybody, with much of romance and little of wit. Any one so constituted will readily so conduct himself, upon occasion of real excitement, as to render himself liable to suspicion on the part of the over-acute or the ill-disposed. Monsieur Beauvais, as it appears from your notes, had some personal interviews with the editor of L'Etoile, and offended him by venturing an opinion that the corpse, notwithstanding the theory of the editor, was, in sober fact, that of Marie. He persists, says the paper, in asserting the corpse to be that of Marie, but cannot give a circumstance, in addition to those which we have commented upon, to make others believe. Now, without re-adverting to the fact that the stronger evidence to make others believe could never have been adduced, it may be remarked that a man may very well be understood to believe, in a case of this kind, without the ability to advance a single reason for the belief of a second party. Nothing is more vague than impressions of individual identity. Each man recognizes his neighbor, yet there are few instances in which any one is prepared to give a reason for his recognition. The editor of L'Etoile had no right to be offended at M. Beauvais's unreasoning belief. The suspicious circumstances which invest him will be found to tally much better with my hypothesis of romantic busybodyism than with the reasoner's suggestion of guilt. Once adopting the more charitable interpretation, we shall find no difficulty in comprehending the rose in the keyhole, the Marie upon the slate, the elbowing the male relatives out of the way the aversion to permitting them to see the body, the caution given to Madame B. that she must hold no conversation with the gendarme until his return, Beauvais, and lastly, his apparent determination that nobody should have anything to do with the proceedings except himself. It seems to me unquestionable that Beauvais was a suitor of Marie's, that she coquetted with him, and that he is ambitious of being thought to enjoy her fullest intimacy and confidence. I shall say nothing more upon this point, and as the evidence fully rebuts the assertion of L'Etoile, touching the matter of apathy on the part of the mother and other relatives, an apathy inconsistent with the supposition of their believing the corpse to be that of the perfumery girl, we shall now proceed as if the question of identity were settled to our perfect satisfaction. And what? I here demanded, do you think of the opinions of Le Commercial? End of the Mystery of Marie Roger, Part 2